blessings, everyone, and welcome to Answers. I'm Dale. Thank you so much for joining with me today. I don't know how it is there with you locally, but boy, where it is right now, where I am, it is raining. How would you say, Nick? Cats and dogs? That's what they say, which is interesting. I wonder where that turn of the phrase came from. Uh, I was going to talk about some things related to that in just a minute. Uh, um, I'm sort of laughing because of some things we were talking about before, because of what we're about to examine in the Word is so easy uh, to get caught up and to get tripped up. But it is raining seriously outside. Now, I know a lot of us watch this on a time delay type of thing. It'll be a different day, and it's probably going to be a beautiful day at the moment when you're watching. And I thank the Lord for that. But right now, we are being blessed with uh, some serious rain and likely some more serious weather later on, about 12 hours from now. Uh, but, you know, you can take some great comfort in that. You know, the Lord says he rains upon the just and the un unjust. But he tells us uh, in... Uh, in the Pentateuch, okay, in the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, the first five books of the Bible, he lays out the law, and he tells the children of Israel what we're going to be looking at a little bit here in a moment, uh, that you have a choice. You can choose blessing, or you can choose curse. You have a choice. You can choose blessing, or you can choose cursing. And uh, th there's an idea behind that, that you can either do what God tells you to do and be blessed, or you can turn against the Lord and be cursed. And one of the curses that the Lord said that he would turn the sky as unto bronze. In other words, that it would not rain and the ground would turn brown. You would have drought. And so particularly here where we are right now, we do not uh, complain when it rains. Because we went through a rather serious drought here, I want to say five years ago, five or six years ago. And uh, we prayed. We actually had uh, times in gatherings where we prayed together that the Lord would send rain because the water tables were extremely, extremely low. And he did. He honored that within a few days and a few weeks it started raining and then some wild things have really happened uh, locally we've had a new dam that was built and so they sealed up the dam and they expected it to take I want to say a year a year and a half to fill it up <laughs> they sealed that thing up the next day it rained so much that it basically filled the dam up in a day or a day and a half what they thought would take a year same thing happened with a previous dam that was built back in the, I think the early 50s they thought it would take three or four years to build and, I mean, to fill it up, and it rained like that and filled it all the way up. And, you know, I think the Lord is trying to say something to us. I'm quite serious about that, that he's trying to say something. I will provide for you if you will choose my way. Uh, now, some of the folks back in the 50s, they lost some things. There's still tractors and cars and houses sitting underwater. They thought they had plenty of time to get the stuff out. <laughs> it was underwater, and it's still underwater to this day. So anyway, uh, I thank the Lord for the rain. I thank the Lord for the times when it doesn't rain. Uh, what we're going to look at today is actually some things that have come out of what we've looked at in previous weeks, which is usually what happens, is that we, we are speaking about things and people ask questions about it. Therefore, the name of the program answers, right? And we started examining it. And one thing that we were looking at uh, two or three weeks ago had to do with the tongue. Okay, let's get the passage that was mentioned about the tongue. It might have come out of 2 Corinthians 5. I don't know. But I thought it would do us well to uh, see some of what the scripture has to say because the scripture says a lot about the tongue. And then we're not talking about just the, uh, uh, the physical organ, though we are talking about the physical organ of the tongue. What we're talking about is, is what we do with the tongue, the speaking forth of words, the power that is involved with that. And so uh, in thinking on that, I knew there was a couple of scripture passages I wanted to go to, and one in particular, uh, Proverbs 15, which says a lot about that. But we're really not going to be able to go there today because I was looking at a couple other things and I thought, I really want to look at this right here before we go there. So just listen to a couple of verses right here and then we're going to go to Deuteronomy 30. Deuteronomy 30. But just to sort of set the table for us, the 39th Psalm says this. The first verse says, I said, I will guard my ways. And this is David saying this. I said, I will guard my ways that I might not sin with my tongue. I will guard my mouth as with a muzzle while the wicked are in my presence. So he's sort of setting up what he's going to say right here in the balance of the psalm. But he's saying when the wicked here are present, I'm going to guard my tongue. I'm going to be careful with what I say so that I will not sin. He literally describes it as he's going to put a guard over his mouth. He's going to put a guard over his mouth. We've talked about that some in times past. But this is actually a very worthy thing to do that I find that I have to uh, uh, reiterate within my life and remind myself from time to time because I have a tendency to have the spiritual gift of gab. 
okay, which really isn't a spiritual gift. In other words, I might talk too much in a situation or, or say too much about something or about this or whatever it may be. And I find that I, I need to just guard my mouth, muzzle my mouth. If asked to say something, reply to something, bring insight, okay, that's fine. But he is saying that he need to do this to where he would not sin before the evil one. Then, over in the 18th proverb, the 18th proverb says this, 21st verse, death and life are in the power of the tongue. You likely have heard that before. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And it goes to what we're going to look at in Deuteronomy 30 about choosing blessing and choosing cursing. Or choosing curses, blessing and curses. Uh, the tongue has power. We can speak forth life into a situation. We can speak forth death into a situation. Even the world acknowledges that within the arena of, let's say, um, raising children, something like that. That if you keep speaking the negative things, if you keep speaking detrimental things, they will come to fruition. You're literally speaking it into existence. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. The rest of the verse, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. And they that love what? Well, I think the idea is they that love whichever one they choose will eat the fruit of it. If you speak forth life into a situation, then you will bear the fruit of life. If you speak forth death into a situation, if you sit there and constantly <coughs> speak forth something to somebody, saying, well, you're so stupid, you're so dumb, you're just like, and well, you'll see that sometimes with families that have been broken and fragmented, when uh, one of the parents is sitting there talking about how bad the child is and you're just like your mom and you're, you're dumb and you're stupid. Well, how do you expect them to grow up and turn out when you've had nothing but death spoken and nothing but death? But I tell you what, it doesn't just apply to what's going out of our tongues to someone else. It applies to us, too. Uh, I teach piano lessons, so quite often, <laughs> more than quite often, all the time, uh, I'll have students, and they'll sit there, oh, I can't do that, I can't do that. And they're literally speaking it forth. They're speaking forth the very fact and the very power that they can't do that. Uh, there's times when they're saying that they can't do that, and what they're really saying is, I'm not going to do that. So you have that issue. A lot of deal with that. No, you're saying you won't do that. No, you're going to do this. But then there's also a thing where they're listening to the lies of the enemy, and they're listening to their own lies coming out of their own deceptive tongue. I can't do that. I can't do that. We're going to see an element of that in just a second that relates to us as believers and the way that we walk and the way that we live. Quite often we will read a verse, and I'll give you the verse. I'll give you the concept, the idea. Scripture says, Be ye holy, for I'm holy. And people say, oh, I know God says that, but I just can't do that. Now think about that for a moment. The Lord tells us to be holy, for he's holy. And he's not speaking to the world. He's speaking to believers. He's telling us to be holy. He's instructing. He's commanding us to be holy. The passage we're going to see in Deuteronomy 30 is going to show us that we're able to do that. It's a choice that we make between blessing and cursing. He's not going to call us and instruct us and tell us to do something that we're not empowered to do. But what do we do? We come back and say, oh, I can't do that. We come back and say, well, everybody sins, so you can't be holy because everybody sins. If someone says that they are holy, then they're just self-righteous and they're religious and they're lying. No, that's not what he's saying this. Be holy because I live within you. You have a choice. So death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit of it. I love the Proverbs because they, they, you know, when you read them, uh, and you need to read the Proverbs, read them regularly. One of the simple ways to read it is just to read a proverb a day. And whatever day it is, read that proverb. For instance, today, uh, at the time of me doing this right now, it's the 31st of the month. Yeah, 31st today. Read the 31st proverb. There's 31 of them. On the first day of the month, read the first one. The second day, read the second one. And you'll be amazed what all you see. But I love it because they just jump from thought to thought to thought. So this says, death and life are in the power of the tongue, right? The very next verse is, Whoso findeth a wife findeth a good thing and obtaineth favor with God. Well, it jumps from, you think, one subject matter to another, but is there any greater place where death and life are spoken by the power of the tongue than in marital relationships? <laughs> See what I'm saying? I think God puts these things together uh, uh, for his purposes, for his good. Now, let's go to Deuteronomy 30, and I'm going to show you why. This is a rather extended passage. I was going to, it's 20 verses. I was going to just read a portion of it, but 
I think it's really important to set the whole thing up to see what's being said. There's power in the tongue. We have a choice. We have the opportunity to speak forth and to say good things or to say bad things. I was with a gathering recently. Okay, I'm going to be very, very careful here. I'm going to guard, guard my tongue. I was with a gathering, and it was uh, of people from different uh, backgrounds and different things. And there's one group that I do some things with, and I told them, okay, when we come into this gathering, I just want you to be cool. I want you to just lay low, okay? Not be false or anything, but just be quiet. Don't respond to anything, and don't really say much to anything. Because there's be, there will be people that will be just totally willing and totally forthright to give their opinion about everything that's going to be happening. So sure enough, that's exactly what happened. We come along, and it was fine. It was great. It was wonderful. But sure enough, there's some people that just felt that it was their role and responsibility to speak forth what they thought about a situation. And the things that they were speaking, they were speaking forth condemnation. They were speaking forth death. Now, if there's things that need to take place, if there's things that need to occur, wonderful then speak it. Then let's communicate. Let's talk about it. But that was not the heart. That was not the attitude. It was just very, very obvious. And the folks that were with me, they were so cool. It was great. They just sat there. They just let it slide off their back. Okay? Because we, that's not part of a role that we have is that when people do this, that we love and we love. And we manifest this love. Okay? We speak forth blessing, not cursing. And we love. Now look at Deuteronomy 30. We'll read a couple verses and take a break. Verse 1. So it shall come about when all these things have come upon you. We're jumping in at the end of the story. I know it. Moses is giving the law to the children of Israel. Again, Deuteronomy means second giving of the law. Deuto to anomy law. Second giving of the law. And it's not because it, it didn't take the first time, though they did ignore it the first time. Uh, it's because the first generation, the generation that was in the desert for 40 years, had all died off now. And the second generation is about to enter into the promised land. Moses is not going to be with them because Moses had sinned. He had gone against what the Lord had told him to do, and the Lord said, I will let you see the promised land, but you're not going to enter in. But Moses is giving that next generation the law. Again, he's reiterating. He's laying it out before them. And in previous chapters, it's talked about blessing and cursing. And God is saying, if you will do this right here, I will bless you. If you don't do this, you will be cursed. And it was just verse after verse after verse after verse of that. So this is the summation of it. And that's what Moses is saying. So it shall be when all these things have come upon you, the blessing and the curse which I have set before you. And God told him, if you will do this, you'll be blessed. If you don't do it, you will be cursed. And then he will say this. And by the way, you're going to do this, and you're going to do this, and you're going to do this, and you're going to do this. But when you repent, I will restore you. The Lord prophesied it over them hundreds and thousands of years in advance. He told them what they were going to be doing. He says, so the blessing, the curse which I set before you, when you these things that come upon you, and you call them to mind in all the nations where the Lord your God has banished you. So from the time of Moses, when they're about to enter into the promised land, God is already telling them, that you're going to be banished to other nations because you're going to be disobedient. It happened hundreds of years later, thousands of years later from that perspective. They were brought back into the land thousands of years later. The northern kingdom was hauled off in 722 B.C. You know when they were brought back? They started coming back and they became a nation again in 1948. Then in our lifetime, it's these things that have happened. Let me read this last part right here and we'll take a break. When these things have happened, and you return to the Lord your God and obey him with all of your heart and all of your soul, according to all that I command you today, you and your sons, then the Lord your God will restore you from captivity and have compassion on you and will gather you again from all the peoples where the Lord your God has scattered you. Tell you what, let me take a break here real quick. We'll come back and I'll tell you a little more about what that means. Okay, so stay with me.
Hi, I'm Jay Mullins with Premier Bank. At Premier Bank, your deposits are insured up to $100,000. Certain IRA accounts are insured up to $250,000. And we've got an FDIC pamphlet here that will tell you how to insure up to $1,200,000. If you want your money to be safe, call me, Jay Mullins, at 737-9900, and let's talk. So the Lord is saying this, when you do these things, okay, and you do these things, and these curses come upon you, and you're scattered all over the earth, he's speaking to the children of Israel. He said, you will be scattered, but a time will come when I will gather you back together. I will have compassion upon you, and I will restore you. They are a nation now, and the Jewish people are still being gathered back to, to Israel. And so a portion of this has been fulfilled, but there's going to be even more of it to be fulfilled when you see things that happen in the end times, okay, the last part of the last days. And so you see this from Deuteronomy. So let's pick up verse 5. Then the Lord your God will bring you into the land which your fathers possessed, and you shall possess it, and he will prosper you and multiply you more than your fathers. So it's the Lord that's prospering and multiplying. Moreover, the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, so you may live. That's the second time we've seen that phrase. Remember when the guy came to Jesus and said, what must I do to be right? Will you be saved? And, and he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, your strength. He was quoting the Old Testament. This is it. You see that passage, that phrase in several places. And so he's saying that the Lord is the one that will circumcise your heart. And the other prophets, you find out that the Lord says, I will take your heart of stone and make it into a heart of flesh, that I am the one that's going to do this. Verse 7, the Lord will inflict all these curses on your enemies and on those who hate you, who persecuted you. So he's telling them from the get-go, if you choose blessing, you'll be blessed. If you choose cursing, you'll be cursed. When you do choose the cursing, which they did, you're going to be punished. You're going to be hauled off into captivity. You're going to be scattered all over the world. It, it happened with the Assyrians. It happened with the Babylonians. It's going to happen again, by the way. You see this in Daniel. You see it in Isaiah. And you see it in some uh, other prophetic literature that it's going to happen again. They're going to be scattered, but then the Lord will bring them back then they will be fruitful, like you said right here, and fill the whole earth. Fill the whole earth. Verse 8, And you shall again obey the Lord and observe all his commandments, which I command you today. Verse 9, Then the Lord your God will prosper you abundantly in all the work of your hands, in the offspring of your body, and in the offspring of your cattle, and in the produce of your ground, for the Lord will again rejoice over you for good, just as he rejoiced over your fathers. If you obey the Lord your God to keep his commandments and his statutes, which are written in this book of the law, if you turn to the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul. Now, a lot of times people say, well, what does that have to do with us as New Testament believers? Because this is all about the law, and they were supposed to keep the law, right? And they had to keep the law, et cetera, et cetera. Well, yes. We are grafted in, though. And the way that we keep the law today as believers, you keep the law in the Lord Jesus Christ. When you repent and confess and call upon the name of the Lord and are saved, that is the fulfillment of the law. Jesus said, I didn't come to do away with the law. I came to fulfill the law. And the reason I wanted to see this is for this next verse because he's telling them, if you will keep my commandments, then you'll do well. Listen to this, verse 11. For this commandment which I command you today is not too difficult for you, nor is it out of reach. He's saying this is not too hard. This is not out of reach. And it's the same thing that happens with us when the scripture tells us, be holy for I am holy. It's not too difficult. It's not out of reach if you will do what God tells us to do, if we'll abide in him, if we're obedient in him. It's not too difficult. The next verse says this, and it's like a quote of what the people would be saying. Is it not in heaven that you should say, will we go up to heaven for us to get it for us and make us hear it that we may observe it? So what he's saying, what God is saying is, don't sit there and say, well, we'd like to do this, but we can't do it because the power to do this is up in heaven. We can't go up there and get it. He says, no, no, no. Now, don't say this either. Nor is it beyond the sea that you should say, who will cross the sea for us to get for us and make us hear it 
that we may observe it. He's saying not. It's not that it's in heaven and it's unattainable. It's not on the other side of the sea in some nation where you have to go get it to where you were empowered to live and obey these commandments. No, no, no. Not that at all. Listen to this. Verse 14, Deuteronomy 30, remember this. But the word is very near you, in your mouth and in your heart, that you may observe it. The word to do right or to do wrong, to choose blessing or to choose curse, is literally in our mouth and in our heart. Because we know what comes out of our mouth is what is really in our heart. Boy, we don't want to think about that sometimes. We really don't want to think about that. But he's saying it is very near you. It is within you, in other words, that you may observe it. Verse 15. See, I've set today before you life and prosperity and death and adversity. So there you go, blessing and curse. Life and prosperity or death and adversity. I've set it before you. He's saying this to the children of Israel as they're about to cross over into the promised land. He said, this is what I've done. He's done the same for us. Verse 16, in that I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways, to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments, that you may live and multiply, and that the Lord your God may bless you in the land where you are entering to possess it. They were entering into the promised land. He's saying, if you will keep my commandments and heed to them, you will be blessed. And you say, well, do we have a promised land to enter into? Yes, we do. When we enter into salvation, that is the promised land. Okay, it's not like it was with them that was going to cross the Jordan and go into a particular place. It is literally the salvation that we have, that we are in the promised land. Quite often you'll hear the good old gospel hymn talking about I'm bound for the promised land. It's talking about going to heaven, going to glory and all this. That's fine, but that's not really what the promised land is. The promised land is our very existence right now as believers. So no matter where I am, I am upon, I am upon the promised land. Then the Lord gives a bit of a word of warning here. Deuteronomy 30, 17. But if your heart turns away and you will not obey, but are drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall surely perish. You will not prolong your days in the land where you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess it. So he's warning them. He's saying if you turn to other gods, your days are not going to be long upon this land. You know what they wind up doing? They wind up turning to other gods. I don't have time to get into details, but they were there for a period of time, hundreds of years they were there. But then eventually they got distracted, and they, the kingdom was split because of the sin within uh, the body, and the northern kingdom was hauled off into captivity a few hundred years later. Now, the last two verses, which sort of brings it all together, and this is God speaking out of just warning them. He says, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today. So the Lord is saying, I'm calling all of creation to testify against you, to be a witness right here of what I'm saying, that I have set before you life and death, the blessing and the curse. It's interesting, it's got the article in there, the blessing, the curse. So choose life in order that you may live, you and your descendants. See, when we read that there's power in the tongue, and there's life and death within the tongue. And a lot of times we want to come back and say, well, I just don't have any control over it. I just speak my mind. How many times have I heard that? And it's just this little righteous, pious type of thing. Well, no, that's not the truth at all. We are empowered to speak what we want to speak. If we want to speak blessing, we are empowered to speak for blessing. If we want to speak curse, we do it because we want to do it. See? And it is sin. And he's saying, don't choose that. Choose life instead. So choose life in order that you may live, you and your descendants, by loving the Lord your God, by obeying his voice, by holding fast to him. For this is your life and the length of your days, that you may live in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give them. We have the same promises today. <clears throat> the promise that was given them was a promise of land, a covenant promise of land that was given. We have the same type of promise in the Most High God. He's promised to give us life. We have a real simple choice to make. Are we going to live within that life 
or are we going to let the cares and the concerns and the distractions of the world sidetrack us? It's real simple. Let me take you to Proverbs. Uh, this is the 15th proverb. We'll probably look at this uh, more next week, but we've got a couple more minutes. Let me just get started on it. And it begins with the very first verse, first proverb of Proverb 15. A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. See, uh, most people believe that Solomon wrote these proverbs, and he learned the hard way. A gentle answer will turn away wrath. But what is our initial response to be if wrath comes up against us? <laughs> we want to rise up in the same way. There's power in the tongue. It's better to speak forth life, a gentle answer, than it is to bring forth harsh words. So all a harsh word is going to do, here it says stirs up anger. It's going to stoke the fire. The second verse, the tongue of the wise makes knowledge acceptable, but the mouth of fools spouts folly. The wise will speak forth life. The fool will speak forth folly, will speak forth death. And then the third proverb right here says this. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, <coughs> watching the evil and the good. In Chronicles, it tells us that the eyes of the Lord are roaming to and fro across the earth, looking for a man that he can come and strengthen, a man that he can come and encourage, a man that he can come and help. The eyes of the Lord are looking, are searching. He knows so what do we do? Here's what we do. We take it before the Lord and say, God, forgive me. And one of the most powerful prayers I think that you can say and that you can lay before God related to this is what I began with at the beginning but didn't, didn't complete. And it's this. Just ask the Lord to throw up a red flag in your mind when you're about to speak something you shouldn't speak. Just say, Lord, just throw up that flag. Just let me know. Just warn me. When I'm about to say something, if I'm about to say it in the wrong way, if I'm saying it out of the wrong motivation, the wrong heart, whatever it is, just warn me, Lord, to where I will muzzle my mouth, to where I can choose life, where I can speak forth life, to where everything that comes out of my life will bring forth benefit for the kingdom of God, particularly the things that we say. You say, well, I can't do that in the flesh. Oh, no doubt. None of us can do it in the flesh. But in the power of the Holy Spirit, we can do it. Try it, and we'll check back next week and see how it went, okay? I'll see you then. Bye-bye.